Good morning, everybody. I always find that Easter week, this past week, the week after Holy Week, is the hardest week of the year for me. Holy Week itself is like for church people, or for the workers and our staff and volunteers of the church, it's like the Super Bowl, the World Series, the World Cup, all combined. It's the big event of the year, much bigger than Christmas, actually. And there's a meme out there, Christ is risen, the pastor is dead. <laughs> Said that last week. <laughs> but anyway, always there's this great exhaustion for us here at the church in the week after Easter Sunday. Uh, it's not just the physical exhaustion and the mental exhaustion, but for me at least, there's also a kind of spiritual agony during Easter week. You see, I think it's easier to ponder the cross than the resurrection. For me, it's more concrete to think about what Jesus did for us on the cross. He died for us, and my sin and my guilt is very concrete. I know my sin. So that's sort of easy to think about. But it's much harder to think about the risen life in Christ, the fact that we're resurrection people, life in the Holy Spirit. What's that all about? For me, that's like pie in the sky. That's out there. And I can't make that as concrete or as, e as easily make that applicable and apply that to my life. Actually, I'll tell a little story. Several years ago, I was a graduate student in Rome, and I went with a group of priests and seminarians the week of Easter to Greece. And we were on vacation the week of Easter. We didn't have school. And the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox Christians often celebrate Easter a different time than Roman Catholics. You might know that. So that year, the Greek Orthodox were celebrating Easter and Holy Week the week after us. And so we stayed with these crazy Jesuits. And the crazy Jesuits said to us, let's repeat Holy Week. And so all these priests and seminarians, we got together and we celebrated Holy Week a second time. And I loved it. <laughs> Anyway, during the course of the Easter season, I'm going to talk about the topic of getting to know the personality of Jesus. What was he like? What were some characteristics of his personality, his likes, his dislikes? What do you think? Well, that'll be what we'll talk about. I said last week that in his earthly ministry alone, in his public life, Jesus was a great man. He was a great leader with a vision. He had a vision for us and for his followers of what could be and what should be, but didn't yet exist. And so for those who struggle with doubt and hope, he encouraged people to deeper faith. In a culture where people's lives were often meaningless and without value, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And in a world where poverty, injustice, slavery was rampant, even violence, every day in commonplace, Jesus brought about a radical freedom and a peace of the heart and mind. Jesus was a great man, powerful in word and deed. He healed people. He fed the multitudes. He had a wisdom that people never heard of, heard of before. He challenged people to go beyond their prejudice and their selfishness. And so he was a great man. He was a great man who could stand up with every great leader and great sage and wise person all throughout history, just in his earthly life alone. But we know he was more than just that. And so he was handed over to death by the authorities. They were jealous of his popularity. They were challenged by what he taught, what he was all about. He suffered brutally on the cross. He died and was buried. And that should have been the end of his story and his vision. But this is where Jesus is separated from every other wise person and sage and teacher and leader who ever, ever lived in human history because they're all dead. We believe that three days later he conquered the grave. And that's what separates Jesus Christ. That's what our religion is all about. If you sum up Christianity... It's about an event and a person. The event of the resurrection and the person 
of Jesus. And so if that's true, if that's true, doesn't it just make sense to get to know him a little more face to face? And that's what we'll be looking at in the next several weeks. So today, I want to just pose the question, how can we apply resurrection life more concretely to us? And how can we specifically move beyond that sense of guilt and shame from our sin and even fear maybe to greater hope and joy and peace. We'll look to look at that. We'll look at today's gospel reading very briefly. It's a story that many people have heard because we always hear it this second Sunday of Easter. It's a familiar story about the doubting Thomas and it picks up like this. On the evening of that first day of the week where the doors when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst. So this first part of the story is the night of Easter, Easter Sunday evening. Remember that the disciples were not breathlessly waiting at the tomb on Easter Sunday morning for Jesus to come out. That was not on their radar. Their leader had been executed as a criminal. And so that meant they were criminals too. They were hiding out for their life. They were in complete fear. And very legitimately so, because the the authorities were looking for them. And on top of that, they were confused, because there was a rumor that the tomb was empty. And actually, Peter and John had run out to the tomb to check it out. And that didn't lift up their spirit. That actually made them even more confused. So on top of this great fear and this confusion they also felt a deep sense of shame and guilt and sadness because their leader, at his greatest hour of need, they had abandoned. They denied him, they lied about him, they let him down. And so it's into this situation that the risen, resurrected Jesus appears. The cool thing about the resurrected body of Jesus is that He can appear and disappear and walk through doors. So instantly, suddenly, he appears. Put yourself in Jesus' place. If all of your friends had just denied you and were nowhere to be found in your greatest hour of need, how would you react? What would you say to them? Probably not something very nice. And on the other hand, put yourself in the place of the disciples. And we can all relate to where they were. You see, we have all, at times, deflected, lied, denied, let people down. Perhaps it's at work. Somebody at work, you didn't do, you didn't do your job and you made your co-worker's job harder. Or you made your boss look bad because you didn't do what you were supposed to do. But perhaps you let down a friend. Your friend had an emergency and they were going to rely on you and you weren't there. You let them down. And perhaps you lied in a relationship or you were dishonest. And perhaps even some of you have betrayed another person. So just imagine if you have hurt somebody like that and then they show up. You probably feel quite awkward, right? <laughs> this is going to get ugly. And so how does Jesus react? He, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And here's the first characteristic about Jesus' personality. He always has the right words to say. His words always have the effect that they intend. Always he speaks the right words. And so for those who are self-righteous and prideful and acting evil, he called them out on that. But for those who are filled with doubt and hopelessness and shame and guilt and sadness, he almost always had a word of encouragement, of peace, of joy, of hope. And so for some of you, maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you have come back to church for the first time since before COVID, or maybe even much before that. And you're sort of on the fence. Maybe you're struggling with doubt and guilt and shame, or you don't know if you feel welcome here. And I would just say to you, don't make it complicated. You're welcome here, and hear Jesus' words to you, peace be with you. And so John goes on. When Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. 
Jesus shows them his wounds, his hands, and his side. And he does so to prove that he both actually died and he actually physically rose. And this reminds us as well that he understands our wounds. He understands our hurts. And then he says again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Now this is story, if you hear it for the first time, is absolutely astonishing. It's amazing. But now it's a whole nother level. Think about it. The same guys that had denied Jesus, who abandoned him, the same guys who were utter cowards, now Jesus is essentially giving them a job. He's saying, I'm sending you out to form a new organization. That organization, of course, is what we call the church. That's why we're here today, because he sent them. And the point is this, my friend. You need to hear this. There is absolutely nothing we can do to mess up enough <laughs> that Jesus won't still encourage us, build us up, and then send us out and use us. Because Jesus believes in you and me. Even when you don't believe in him, he believes in you. Even when you don't believe in you, he believes in you. A lot of us need to hear those words. And just to drive that point home, then the story takes a twist. The part you're probably familiar with. We hear Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve was not with him when Jesus came. So the disciples said to him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into his nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, Thomas stands in for every, anyone and everyone, which is pretty much all of us, who have doubted. We all have struggled with doubt at a certain time. Have you ever been on the receiving end of someone who doubted you? Someone who you had a great relationship with? Maybe it was a, a parent or a friend or a sibling, a co-worker. You thought you had a great relationship, but then they doubted you. They withdrew their trust from you. They questioned you. That can be very, very hurtful. So again, how does Jesus respond? He says, well, we see... And John, John says, a week later, his disciples were, again were inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and st stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Third time. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, and see my hands, and bring your hand, and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. My friends, doubt is normal. Doubt is Part of the process. Doubt is not something that keeps us from entering into a relationship. So I ask married couples, do you ever doubt your spouse? Don't answer that question. <laughs> do you completely understand your spouse? Of course not. You see, in any relationship, there's always a sense of doubt and uncertainty. It doesn't prevent us from going deeper into that relationship. Jesus here demonstrates a wonderful aspect of his personality. He is both clear and he's kind. Those are two aspects that often don't go together. It's very rare in a person. And so I, I, I often think he's joking here and playing with Thomas. He said, just put your doubt aside for a minute and stick your finger in my side. Gross, yuck. But there's a sense here of playfulness. Jesus is essentially saying, okay, you doubt, but that's not going to prevent me from having a relationship with you. Just put your doubt aside for a minute and step up. Put it aside, step up, take an action step. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. And again, isn't that rare in a person that they're both kind and they're clear? I, I, most of us are either one or the other or neither, but that's Jesus' personality. He is invests in a genuine relationship with Thomas because he believes in Thomas. He believes in doubting Thomas that, he, that Thomas will have a role to play. And that's the thing about a relationship 
with Jesus Christ, specifically with him. That it's always going to transform us. It's always going to change us and lead us to grow. So as we begin this Easter season, I just invite you to play an active role in this topic that I'm preaching about. Get face to face with Jesus. And it's very simple. The first invitation is just follow us week to week. Follow the message the next several weeks. And just invest in, in listening and hearing to know that Jesus invests in you. He wants the best in you. And daily, I challenge you to an even more active role. You see, the, really the best way, the, the only way to really, really get to know Jesus is to read what the Word of God says about him. And so my challenge is for you to pick one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, Pick one of them in the Bible and try to read it in the next 50 days, in the season of Easter. They're each different. They all have a unique perspective on Jesus. So Matthew, which we're hearing now, that's the one I'm going to read, has more of Jesus teaching and preaching. Mark is the shortest of the four. And it's a great dramatic story in Mark's gospel. Luke's gospel is the greatest storytelling and displays the mercy of Jesus more clearly than the others. And John, John's gospel, which we just heard an excerpt of, is the most mystical, theological, poetic. So which one of the four might attract you? The challenge is, the Easter challenge, is to read it. T pick a time early in the morning, late at night, at lunchtime, while you're waiting for your kids at the bus stop. Five or ten minutes a day will, will be more than enough. And just pray before you read, just say, Jesus, grant me the grace to get to know your personality more deeply. Grant me the grace to know you face to face. And so, my friends, in this Easter season, Jesus wants to apply that reality, the reality of the risen life to our practical life more clearly. And so, don't miss out on that invitation. Amen.